Hello everyone, and now let's do another graph. So let's construct the graph of the function f of x, the cubic root of x minus 1 squared, also known as x minus 1 to the power 2 third. So first step, computing the domain of the function. Well, here there's no denominator, so no division by 0. There's no even root. A cubic root can swallow something positive or negative, so that will never crash. And obviously, there's no logarithmic term. So this is a nice function that is actually defined everywhere on the whole real line. So um, the function has uh, a domain of r, which is from minus infinity to infinity. So this means that there's two important limits to set up, one going to minus infinity, and the second one going to plus infinity. Um, so. Again, step two now is just to define and then compute those limits. So boom, here we go. So those are the two important limits. The limit as x goes to minus infinity of x minus 1 to the power 2 third, and the limit as x goes to infinity of x minus 1 to the power 2 third. Those two limits, we will be able to compute them simply by evaluating them at minus and plus infinity. Uh, respectively. So here we go. So let's plug in minus infinity. So you get minus infinity minus 1. So to the power 2 third, it's always easier to power it by the numerator first and then to the denominator. So it's the same thing as power 2 to the power 1 third. So you get minus infinity squared to the power 1 third. And that's infinity to the power 1 third, which is just infinity. And now for the other one, at uh, limit going to plus infinity, you get infinity minus 1 squared to the power 1 third. So you're going to get infinity squared to the power 1 third, which is infinity to the 1 third, which is infinity. So this means that this function has no horizontal asymptote going to minus infinity or plus infinity. So you just get you're just going to get two branches that goes up forever on both sides. Now let's compute the derivative. So I'm really going to use the fact that this function can be written as x minus 1 to the power 2 third and just use a chain rule. So the 2 third falls up front for f prime. The new power is the former power minus 1. So 2 third minus 1 will be minus 1 third. So poof. So you get that f prime is 2 third times x minus 1 to the power 2 third minus 1, which is minus 1 third, times the inside derivative, but here it's just 1. And you can rewrite this as 2 over 3 cubic root of x minus 1. And now for the second derivative, I'm again going to use um, a chain rule. So I'm going to use, I'm going to start from the fact that f prime is 2 third times x minus 1 to the power minus 1 third. So poof. And then when you do the chain rule, the one, the minus one third times two third will be minus two over nine. The new power is minus one third minus one, which is minus four third times the inside derivative, which is just one here. So if you simplify this, you get minus two at the numerator, you get a nine at the, at the denominator, and x minus one to the power minus four at the power, yeah, to the minus four over three. So you take this in a cubic root, add the denominator to the power 4. So the simplified version will be helpful to fill up the super sign table. Now let's study our critical point. So for f prime, when is f prime undefined? And this is very interesting because it's the first uh, example of a function that we get where this function is defined everywhere. We're going to, to, to draw that function in one shot without our li lifting our pen, but... Uh, we have here a critical point. It's the first time we get a critical point of the 4. F prime is undefined because when is the denominator going to be equal to 0? Well, it's going to be equal to 0 when x is equal to 1. So at x equal 1, f prime crashes. And when is f prime going to be equal to 0? No, if you just look at the numerator, it's just 2. It's never going to be equal to 0. So only one critical point at 1 of the form f prime is undefined. And now for f prime prime, it's the exact same analysis. It crashes at 1 because the denominator will be 0 if x is equal to 1, and the numerator is never going to be equal to, um, it's never going to be equal to 0 because it's minus 2. 
So there's only one important point here that we got from step four, and it's one. So then we wonder what's up before. One, so from minus infinity to one, what's up after? So from one to infinity. So the reason why one is there, it's because f prime and f prime prime are undefined. Now let's fill up the sign table. So if we start with f prime, uh, if you pick, for example, x equals zero, zero minus one is going to be negative one. The cubic root of negative one is going to be negative times three under a two. That's going to be negative. So the function is decreasing from minus infinity to one. And then after one, if you pick, for example, two, two minus one uh, is going to be equal to one. The cubic root of one is one times three under a two. This is going to be positive. So the function is going to be increasing from one to infinity. What about the sign of the second derivative? Well, if you're clever enough here, x minus one to the power of four is always going to be positive. The cubic root of something positive is always going to, going to be positive times nine, that's positive, but it's under a minus two. Actually, actually here, f prime prime is always going to be negative. So now I'm going to be able to visually see what's going on on f. So because of the minus, I know that my function is decreasing, the minus for the sine of f prime, but then because of the sine of the second derivative to b that is also negative, I have a function that is decreasing concave down. And then afterward, the plus for the first derivative tells me that the function is increasing. And then because of the negative one, at the second derivative, I know it's increasing, still concave down. That's the only arrow that is increasing concave down. So what's happening at one? Well, I have a local minimum. So local minimum. And if you can already look at the arrows here, it's pretty cool. We are really at the crack here. So our function has a local minimum at x equal one, but it's a new kind of one, like it's a one where we're going to get a corner. Okay, so. Um, all right, so now let's find some important points. So we know one is important. If you replace x by one in the original function, you're going to get a zero because one minus one is zero, cubic root to the power two third, which is zero. Since zero is in the domain, then the y-intercept, so when you replace x by one, uh, you're, by zero, sorry, you're going to get zero minus one squared, which is one cubic root of that is just going to be one again. So I already have those two points drawn for you. So the only thing you have to do here is draw the function. So connect those two points with the shape of the function. So here we go. Okay, so first from minus infinity to one, we have a function that is decreasing concave down and then it's bouncing back as increasing concave down still. And you look at this sharp pointy, uh, local minimum here, pretty cool stuff. And again, again, I cannot stress that fact enough. Okay, so when you are done with drawing the graph of your function, make sure that the graph is consistent with the domain. So here I see I have one continuous curve, uh, no hole, no vertical asymptote. So it's consistent with the domain found in one. What about the important limits? Well, we found out that when x was going to minus infinity, the graph was going up to infinity. Well, that's consistent with that graph. And then when x was going to infinity, the graph was also going to infinity. Well, that's consistent again with that graph. So the two important limits are well reflected in that graph. And of course, now the shape, my function is decreasing until the local minimum one, and then it's increasing forever. It's concave down everywhere. I have a local min at one. And you see here, we have this pointy, local minimum. If you look at your graph, you know there's no derivative at one. This is something you're, you're, you know how to identify on a graph. So it's consistent with what we found in step five. So always make sure that the graph of your function is consistent with step one, step two, and step five. All right, for that example, that's it. That's all. Bye-bye,